Welcome back, everybody. Our final panel of the day is going to be chaired by Ashling Glynn, who is a practicing solicitor and also a member of the NDA board. And I am delighted with Ashling to welcome Helen, Joe, John and Michael to discuss how the legislation will directly impact their lives. So over to you, Ashling. Thank you, Aideen. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to welcome you all to this afternoon's panel discussion. Thank you to the NDA for inviting me to chair the session. As Aideen said, I've been a member of the board of the National Disability Authority since 2017. I also work as a solicitor with McMahon and Williams Solicitors in Clarush County Clare. I have a particular interest in disability law and I regularly deal with enduring powers of attorney and advanced planning. I have an acquired disability myself. I am a wheelchair user. I have experience of life both with and without a disability. As a disabled person, I have experience of being treated differently. Like many others, I have experienced negative attitudes and perceptions. There can be a tendency to view persons with disabilities as incapable or certainly as less capable. Article 12 of the UNCRPD obliges state parties to recognise that persons with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with other persons and to take all appropriate measures to provide persons with disabilities with the support they need to make those decisions. The title for this afternoon's session is Hopes for the Legislation from Individuals Whose Lives Will Be Impacted. First of all, as has been stated earlier, but I think it's important to restate here, that all of our lives will be impacted by this legislation. Capacity will become everybody's business. Everyone will enjoy the benefit of the presumption of capacity, regardless of age or disability. Any one of us may need to use the provisions of the Act at one time or another during our lifetimes. However, there are people who may be the more immediate beneficiaries of the decision-making supports under the Act. And this includes people with an intellectual disability, mental illness, acquired brain injury, or some people with age-related cognitive conditions that affect their capacity. We have an excellent lineup of speakers this afternoon who will share their views and their different perspectives. I now introduce them all. First of all, we're joined by Joe McGrath. Joe is the Vice Chair of the Steering Group of the National Platform for Self-Advocates. He's also the Ministerial Representative. I'm sure many of you know, but for those who don't, the National Platform of Self-Advocates is an independent organisation run by people with an intellectual disability for people with an intellectual disability. The group is find, founded on the rights of persons with an intellectual disability to be included as equal citizens with rights as outlined in the UNCRPD. Joe is a self-advocate and an advocate for people with intellectual disabilities. He has worked with the Inclusive Research Network also, and like myself, Joe is a proud uh, County Clare man. We're then joined by Helen Rochford Brennan. Helen is the chair of the Irish Dementia Working Group and a member of the European Working Group of People with Dementia. Helen has spent many years working in the disability sector and in community activism. In 2012, Helen was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease and she uses her time with the Irish Dementia Working Group to raise awareness of dementia and to raise the profile of human rights for people with dementia. Michael Ryan is head of HSC Mental Health Engagement of Reco and Recovery. Michael was appointed to this role in 2019. He brings his own lived experience of mental health challenges and now enjoys a full life in recovery. Michael has spoken about the importance of recovery being at the centre of mental health services and he recognises that family members are vital in the development of how we continue to improve mental health services. Finally, we're joined by John Dunn. John is Chief Executive Officer of Family Carers Ireland. Family Carers Ireland is a national charity that for almost 30 years has worked to improve supports, services and net recognition for family carers. Family Carers Ireland engage with up to 30,000 family carers each year. John and Family Carers Ireland have been paying close attention to the development of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act 2015, including before it was even drafted. John has said that almost every family carer wishes the best outcome for their loved one, and that is ultimately the motivation that underpins the Act. However, implementation is not without its challenges, and we will hear some of this today. 
the format will be like earlier. I have a series of questions to put to each panel member and there will be time at the end for questions and answers. Okay, so I will go to Joe first of all. Um, Joe, how will the introduction of the Act impact on your life and on the life of others with intellectual disabilities? Joe, you need to unmute yourself, sir. No, um, a lot will depend on how people, how other people will interpret the law. Like if I want to go to a solicitor and have someone support me, will the solicitor talk to me or the supporter? The new law says, we should follow my wishes, but what some, someone doesn't get it right, we can't blame people for not getting it right all the time, but they, but they might, um, and have to try harder the next time to learn uh, of my wishes. Thank you, Joe. And I'll put the same question now to Helen, please. Helen, you also need to mute yourself, please. Uh, excuse me, Helen, you need to mute yourself. Sorry, I'm in very poor coverage in the Black Isle of Scotland, where I'm calling you from. So could you repeat the question again, please? Thank you, Helen. So we were just asking, how will the introduction of the Act impact in your life and the life of other people who are living with dementia or other age-related conditions that might affect their capacity? Right. Well, as a person living with dementia, the Assistant Decision Making Act in Ireland means that I am no longer subject to the archaic 1871 Lunacy Act. And believe me, if you have dementia, that is the last thing you want to be remembered to think about. The Assistant Decision Making Act, if implemented on the ground through practice and services, will have a pro profound effect on my life. It would mean that my voice is heard in decisions that shape my quality of life and my future. In the past, or under the old system, the enduring power of attorney had a very narrow focus and only extended to financial decision making. It was also based on decisions being made in my best interest and not in my will and preference. The distinction being between best interest and will and preference contained in the new act is important as it essentially delegates power and control back to the individual like me to decide what I want to do with my life and what I believe is best for me and not what others think are in my best interest. In this way, the Act ensures that the lack of capacity to communicate or articulate my decision does not take away my inner voice or personhood, and personhood matters to me. It will mean that my family have a framework to speak out for me and uphold the wishes when I no longer can. When I die, I want to die in peace and do not want anyone to come along jumping at me to try and resuscitate me. The new act allows me for this provision. Fundamentally, the act will force a cultural shift in the health and social care system at last. In time, I would hope to see a decrease in the use of chemical restraint and a decrease in the number of people admitted to institutional care against their wishes, which we currently see. Thank you, Helen. Okay, so to move on to Michael next. Michael, I put the same question to you. How do you think the introduction of the Act will impact on your life and the life of others with living with mental health difficulties? Michael, you're also, um, if you wouldn't mind unmuting, please. My apologies, it's the, the, the quote of the pandemic, please unmute. Um, no, uh, I'd just like to say, uh, Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak on the panel this, this afternoon. And in 
from a perspective of, of mental health service users or family members, carers and supporters, um, we very, very much welcome uh, the, the new act. It aligns very well with what uh, we're trying to do in mental health in terms of uh, the recovery approach, in terms of co-production and partnership uh, between uh, people who provide services and those uh, who use them and support those who use them. Um, so I think the, the Act will deliver a lot of uh, benefits if it's implemented in, in that manner in, in terms of um, it, it, it will empower people uh, to be leaders in, in, in their own care. Um, uh, it will help engagement um, uh, with services. I think it will help uh, reduce um, uh, prices. Um, and um, <clears throat> I suppose it, it will hopefully um, uh, reduce uh, communication challenges, uh, coercive um, actions. Um, so overall, it's, it's, it's to, to, to be uh, welcomed very much. And uh, in terms of even areas such as where restricted practice might be needed, even that could be uh, um, uh, pre-planned, if, if you like, through the Act. Um, but I suppose our major concern with this, with it, is that uh, people who are, are detained under the Mental Health Act, uh, the Act will not apply to them. They will not have the opportunity to uh, um, write uh, uh, an advanced di directive. And um, you know, we, we feel very strongly about that. Stigmatizing is discriminatory. Um, so, um, what we work with in terms of its definite uh, approach, um, uh, acceptable to, to, to us, um, and uh, you know, where, where people have capacity uh, but but choose a, a, you know, a, a, a different type of approach or a different type of care, you know, is, is, is a fundamental. Um, human right, uh, and they should be allowed to express that autonomy uh, as well. Um, so I suppose that that's that's our concern, but we broadly welcome the, the the act. Thank you, Michael. And I think we'll be moving on in a few minutes to talk about our concerns in more detail. So you will come back to that. Um, we'll move on to John. And John, can I put the same question to you, please? Mm -hmm. And that's how you think the act is going to impact on the lives of family carers? I'll give you a very concise answer at the end, but just to make two points. The first one is, I think it's impossible to answer the question because at this stage, we haven't a clue what's going to be in the amending legislation. And we also have absolutely no insight into the detailed codes and guidance which are going to inform the implementation. So in fact, you just, we, we, I, I would have to reserve a position on that. The second thing I'd say is families live with practical realities. And a lot of the discussion today has been I suppose, informed by vision and idealized models and aspirations. And a lot of us talked about um, permanent plenary guardianship. And that frankly is, is a space that most families won't recognize because that's not the space they're in. Um, I think the legislation is primarily at a very high level only going to impact on families caring for individuals with significantly diminished capacity. I don't, I don't see families rushing to formalize current informal arrangements further down the, the, the spectrum. I mean, on the plus side, on you referred earlier to the idea of replacing uncertainty with certainty, and that's definitely the prize that we would be pursuing or hoping for, and it's why we're currently part of what's been called earlier the Coalition of the Willing. But equally, in the first session this morning, Alberto spoke of an over-reliance on families in South America, and there'd very much be a concern here in that direction an increased burden on families, a lack of supports, and a problem, or these problems being denied and effectively hidden behind front doors. So the issues that Official Ireland has with the current legislation are being addressed. There's been no serious effort to engage with or address the concerns expressed by families. Thank you, John. And hopefully the uh, public consultations that were mentioned earlier will provide an opportunity to do that. Well, it might be a bit late in the day, frankly. This is five years in. Okay. Um, well, to move on to uh, discussing such challenges, that brings us to the next question. I will, I'll go back to Joe. Joe, could you tell me a bit about what you see the challenges to the proper implementation of the Act? No, um, the, 
The one challenge is the implementation of it and how parents and guardians and siblings are going to understand the implementation, the law, or how they are going to help their family member to understand the new law and what it means for them and if the judge uh, nominates someone to make a decision for the person they also have a, a challenge to understand the individual if they have never worked with the person like that before and they might might not open up to the person the judge appoints another big challenge would be for the independent advocates and what's involved for them okay thank you joe and i think you've touched on some important points there for example the importance of the judicial training and um, that was referenced earlier on so could I move on to Helen? Helen, can I put the same question to you in terms of what you see as the greatest challenges to the implementation of the Act? Helen? Oh, well, now I would love to be really positive about this, but after all these years, I'm a bit cautious as to what I'm going to say because I'm waiting so long for it. Look, there'll be many challenges to uh, fully implement the legislation. We need to ensure our rights are met as people with dementia or will and preference must be respected and at the center of decisions being made. Enduring power of attorney uh, can be extremely costly as I'm aware of for people with dementia. Uh, and how can this be made affordable? I mean, it's important that we remember there's a, a huge cost factor here and that that's, you know, most people are on very limited income and we need, that needs to be addressed. It is vital that the advanced healthcare uh, directives are recorded in advance and the person living with dementia is assisted to do so. One of the difficulties with dementia, like mine, young onset Alzheimer's, is that it can take many years for uh, the diagnosis, twice as long as for late onset, so for a final diagnosis to be got. And by then, the person may no longer have the mental capacity, so, and they will not be able to... Uh, make either an advanced health care directive or an enduring power of attorney, and that is a difficulty. And even when the person living with dementia has, still has capacity, our ability to engage in future care planning, our doctors will be brutally honest with us, I suppose. We want them to be communicating to us and not to others, may I add, which they're very good at at the moment, communicating to our families. The news of our diagnosis, our prognosis, and meaning this has, uh, and the meaning this has for current and future or future lives. It also requires doctors to be familiar with the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act and to be aware that time is the main currency with which a person with dementia deals. We need to get our affairs in order on time, not when it is too late. Some doctors are good at being brutally honest and good at taking on new learning, but others may not be interested. In some cases, there may be family resistance. Traditionally, families in Ireland have been making decisions for their loved ones with living with dementia until now. They will need to respect what we want and what we choose. And it's important our families remember that. Perceptions will need to change. And this will take time. It may take a lot of time. It is vital that the implementation of this legislation is planned and that the act is ex explained clearly and easily to those living with dementia. Many people living with dementia may not be used to making their own decisions. They will require advocacy and decision making, clear guidelines on how, to, how decision making and co decision making, assisted decision making will be required. And if a person living with dementia changes their mind, how that will be implemented. Thanks. Thank you, Helen, for that very comprehensive answer. Um, Michael, could I move on to you next, please, to speak to the challenges uh, as you see them to the proper implementation of the Act? Sorry. 
Have we lost Michael? Yeah, Michael, I think we're going to kill your video and just can't, and just have your audio. So give me one second. Thank you. Um, and I, uh, No, I think, um, Ashling, move on to the next person and then we'll come back to Michael later. Uh, Michael, if you could hear us, I suggest you try logging out and back in again. Okay. okay. Thank you, Cormac. John, I, can I move on to you, please, for this, the same question? Sure. Um, well, first of all, to start off on a positive note, I mean, we want, we want this to be successful. I think the aspiration is absolutely right. Uh, so my, my first worry, though, is that, that confidence in the changes are slipping away and therefore people's willingness to embrace them. Um, I mean, the points we made over and over about messaging and, and getting it out there and communicating, actually the first issue is substance. There's no point in communicating until we're clear about the substance. And it, it remains a fact that, you know, not more than six months out from the target commencement date, there's an awful lot of the substance that still isn't visible. So that would be a serious concern. Our second concern, and we've been flagging this for years and haven't got a single expression of, of acknowledgement or anything, is, is to do with the transition phase. Wards of court have been given three years um, to make the transition for 2,150 cases or thereabouts, and they worry it isn't long enough. There's absolutely no provision for families who've been caring for what are now adults uh, with profound disabilities for all of their lives. Um, when this legislation is commenced, the only certainty is that these parents become invisible until they're processed under the Act. Uh, there's talk now of emergency intervention legislation that may or may not succeed in satisfying the concerns of the medical professions, professionals, but it's only demonstrating or reinforcing the fact that families are invisible, totally disappeared. It may be true that there was no, never a legal basis for next of kin, but there was a custom and practice around it which will disappear overnight. So there's, we think there's a totally legitimate issue there for families. We do have plan B in operation to prepare for it, but it's extraordinary that nobody's actually said, okay, mm -hmm. this is what we think we should do about this. The biggest challenge in terms of the full implementation though, as I understand it, the Irish attempt to write out best interest from the legislation is quite unusual in international terms. For family carers, best interest and maximizing autonomy are entirely aligned. They don't see a conflict between them, but apparently the UN does and the legislation does. So families will struggle with that. Um, and I think uh, there's a growing concern amongst families about the pressure they'll be under to vindicate people's wishes. And it's interesting, this echoes what Creve have commented about in terms of the challenge with the HSC. And also the whole question of, in terms of the risks within that the legislation creates for families, how is retrospective safeguarding going to be done when capacity assessment is time specific? Alex Rook Keane, when he was talking, he, he highlighted how the system in the UK, which has a legal framework for best interest model, has developed in kind of what he was, well, he's used the word, but let's call them perverse ways or unexpected ways. And we were told a long time ago that the spirit of the existing legislation in terms of families is that families, most families are wonderful, but you can't trust them all. Well, all I can say is families will say back, the state's wonderful on many occasions, but you certainly can't trust it either. That to me, that internal contradiction and the attempt to sort of deny best interest as something that's illegitimate and conflicting with self-actualization for people, that to me is, I think, the root of the biggest challenge to the long-term implementation of the legislation. Okay, thank you, John. And I think that uh, your answer is very connected to my next question, but I'm just going to return to Michael if we have him to Michael, are you with us? Um, hello, yes, I'm, I'm here if you can hear me. Thanks, Michael. So just to ask you, what do you see as uh, the challenges to the implementation of the Act? Um, I think they've been well covered by the, the other panelists. Um, but as I said earlier, um, from a mental health perspective, uh, Michael, uh, the position uh, currently that, that someone who's detained under the Mental Health Act, um, uh, you know, can. Hello. Will I continue? The, can you hear me? the line is very bad, Michael. We might, we might try, we might come back to you 
for, for the next question. Sorry about that. We can't hear you very well. Okay, I'm okay. going to, to move back and I think I'll, I'll start with John this time because I think, as I said, John, your answer was very connected to the last question. John, can I ask you, what supports do you think that family carers need to prepare for the implementation? Well, now you're, you're, you're talking about family carers out in the population, whereas I'm partly thinking about family carers as an organisation. I mean, it, it echoes what I said already. The first thing we need to see is a pretty clear visibility of how the system is going to finally be designed and work. And we need that well in advance of full commencement, which seems a bit unlikely at this point, frankly, if we're simply going to be starting consultation on substantive documents, you know, before the end of the year, six months out. And um, the second thing we need is some answer on the transition arrangement. I mean, at the moment, we're looking at setting up uh, a family care or law centre on the basis that we, we anticipate several hundred families wanting to be in court on day one. We don't anticipate the system wanting to facilitate that, but we think they're absolutely entitled to that under the legislation. And the third um, issue would be to do with, um, the, and this is a slight concern, that as I see it going forward, the main driver of how our members will engage with the introduction and implementation of the legislation is going to be judicially, it's going to be through, legis through, through legal challenges. And that's because we haven't been able to engage in any other way. I'm not saying that's my preferred option. I think it's the only likely option that's going to be effective. Okay, and can I ask you, what do you think, the, this is a question that has come in from uh, one of the audience, what do you think the current level of awareness is among family carers generally or, you know, speaking to your organisation as well? Um, I mean, we've, we've been promoting it uh, and to be fair with the Decision Support Service and various other organisations for a number of years now, um, it, it is there is an awareness there. Uh, I think among the people, like it's it's an awareness amongst the people who are likely to be affected. There are about half a million family carers in Ireland. It's a very small proportion of that population who are going to be, I think, really impacted by this. Most of those, I think, are aware of it. Most of those have have engaged and disengaged in the meantime because there's so many answers we can't give. We're saying the same points for years, and it, this isn't about the decision support services, it's about the NDA, written to the Minister for Justice and, and asked some very specific questions and not got any answers. So, uh, I mean, our, our attitude is we're aware of it because we don't know what's exactly coming down the line. It's very hard to get excited one way or the other. Um, but people certainly aren't going to waste their time engaging in something on the basis of, you know, the usual platitudes, family carers are wonderful and they get over there in the corner and do whatever we want you to do or need you to do. Okay, thank you John and again hopefully the public consultation will provide an opportunity to have meaningful consultation and also I think you know having been involved with the codes of practice I think they'll also be very helpful in terms of providing guidance. But can I just say actually I'm not suggesting there isn't a lot of hard work going on the frustration mm -hmm. is being on the outside having concerns which seem to us to be legitimate which aren't being engaged with or answered even if it was, look, we take that on board and we'll be back to you. There has been no dialogue whatsoever. So family carers, this is rather alarming as a, as a signal for how the system is going to work. Okay. Thank you, John. Joe, could I return to you, please, Joe, to ask you what supports you feel people with intellectual disabilities would need to prepare for the legislation? Right. Um, the supports we need would be to understand the law and what the consequences for me making a decision. I have to stand over the decision and I don't, I, if I uh, halted or hold up uh, before the judge to explain how I made the decision that might make me uncomfortable. Being able to meet that judge in advance might help people, people need to have someone in the community they can go to to get um, advice and make sure the individual 
understands the law and the process. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Now, in, in relation to John's question there, he said about the family carers going to court. He, it would also mean that the individual would need a solicitor to go on to court if, if there was a challenge to be taken um, on, 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 on a member of the family taking a challenge to court because the individual would need a solicitor by himself as well. Absolutely, um, Joe, that's a very good point and that is encompassed under the Act. Helen, can I move on to you, please, to ask you what support you feel the well, well, first of all, I, I do want to say that I thank Jagalink Rogan and her team for the amazing amount of work that they are doing on this. And it is not going to be easy um, ensuring that everyone who needs this act is aware of it. Certainly, it, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, people living with dementia and their families and caregivers, healthcare and medical professionals all need to be educated on the act. And, and this is a huge job, but it must be addressed rather soon. Education and planning will be key factors in implementing this. And unless we have that, there's no point in implementing it. The Sister Decision-Making Capacity Act provides for a range of decision supporters called interveners who can be appointed to support the person with capacities in question. There will be decision-making assistants, good decision-makers, enduring power and attorney, and of course, healthcare directors. So the safeguarding will be required when these people are being selected. How will we ensure that the decision-making assistants and decision-makers have our best interests at heart? We will be required to undergo uh, a vetting procedure. What happens if I want to change my mind? And these things are important to remember. There will be need to be accountability and consequences. We will need monitoring throughout the process to keep us safe. I'm aware that the director of the decision-making support service will have the power to investigate complaints in relation to any action by a decision maker in relation to their functions. But how, elect, how exactly will this be implemented? We will need creative solutions for the support we need to stay well, and that's important to us. Easy, accessible financial support will be required. As I said earlier, these things are not cheap. Um, enduring power of attorney, are, are, and, and again, that is something that must be taken on board. So it's easy step-by-step -step procedures will be required to make this act accessible to all who need it. And that is important. I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. And I'm sorry that I'm calling you from, <laughs> from my car. Uh, I have really poor service and thanks a lot. Thank, thank you, Helen, for your answer there. I think you, you raised very important points in relation to advanced planning. And I know certainly in my role as a solicitor, when I started 10 or 11 years ago, um, enduring powers of attorney were very much unknown, but we're starting to see there's definitely a greater awareness and hopefully that will continue because that's something that actually applies to everyone and that, that can help everyone. And actually another thing that you should have there is the, the, the doctors need to be, be educated in advance. Uh, when they when they when they when when they're going to when they're going to college to become a doctor, that's when this thing should be should be um, taught while while they're at while they're at college to become a doctor. Absolutely, Joe. That's that's a very important point, and it's actually it's a question that has just come in, so you've already answered it. Um, but I think you're right, and particularly because we have been dealing with wardship for a number of years, and the focus has been very much on a medical model, um, you know, terms such as person of unsound mind. So I totally agree with you. I think that education and training is really important. Um, so I think you think that doctors in particular would need, would need some training. I might actually just uh, keep this theme going and ask other people what they think because it has come in as a question. Um, John, if I could put that question to you, is there any particular profession you think that most would benefit from, from training? <laughs> well, you can, you can start with the core list. <laughs> no, look, all professions. I, I go back to my basic point. I don't know what you'd be training them on at this stage because the systems still aren't clear. When it happens, uh, 
I mean, it, it's absolutely true to say this should become part of the core curriculum for professional formation going forward. But don't forget there's going to be a huge population of people already out practicing in the system. And I don't know if normal, a normal approach to CPD is going to be enough to cover their retraining under this new system, which is going to be quite complicated. And it's going to take a while to, I suppose, bed in and become clear to people. OK, and John, just Anya Flynn has uh, just sent a message there to say that um, she'd like to invite family carers to engage again with the DSS and um, to help to address any such practical concerns such as those mentioned today. Um, you know, they do, as she said earlier, there's a duty to promote understanding and they're very opening to continuing the dialogue around that. Well, just to be say, to be clear, and I did try and signal earlier, this, this wasn't a coders attack at Anya or the DSS. I, I mean, in, in, in my experience, a lot of the issues we're concerned about are outside the remit of the DSS to control. So just to say that on the record, but Anya, very happy to go back and talk to you again. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, can I put the same question to you, please, in terms of uh, the importance of training and is there any particular profession that you think would benefit from such training? I'm not sure if we still have. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, Michael, no, we can't. I'm going to nip that in the bud, sir. Um, your um, network is that, as the other panelists have said, um, that uh, Ashling, I don't, yeah, I think that's a no go there. I think you just need to carry on there. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Joe, can I return to you um, to ask a question that we raised earlier? What do you think the current level of awareness is amongst your own members or amongst people with intellectual disabilities? Um, I'd say some might be might be aware of aware of, of, of the legislation now, but a lot a lot of us will need to to engage with it uh, with more training on it and um be kept up to date with, with, the, with the with the legislation going forward because i don't even think families nor 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 individuals have even talked about um legal capacity at all yeah. very few very few may have you know sure your organization is very important in um, enhancing the learning in that sense. Yeah. Okay. Can we return to Helen if she's still with us? Uh, Helen? Helen. Helen dropped off, I think, as well. Okay, no problem. Um, I will go to John again. John, can I ask you just to return to the title of this session? What's your greatest hope for the legislation? I mean, my hope is a system which works, which allows uh, the certainty of having the status. And as I say, it's mainly at the upper end of the spectrum. We'd be looking so decision making representatives that does create uh, a context in which family carers can be possibly for the first time properly recognized in terms of the role. And I mean, I'm being quite partisan. Our focus is on family carers. Clearly, there's there's other advantages to this whole legislation, too. Um, the, that's the that's the prize. the The worry is because the, the pattern generally is the state looks at a situation, says this is what we'd like to do. Says next thing is this is what we can do, and then whatever's left, it's basically well. Of course, that's really ultimately that's the family's responsibility. Go away and cope, and it's not just go away and cope in this situation. It's that this law will fundamentally change the basis and the context within which families are trying to cope. And frankly, nobody can tell now. Well, no one's made an effort to tell me, and I can't see how to do it. Um, nobody can anticipate how this is going to work in practice. It may be there's nothing there for families to worry about, but there's certainly legitimate questions. And until effectively case law starts coming down the line, nobody's going to know. Okay, John, I think I'm going to take this opportunity, if Anya doesn't mind, maybe coming in to pick up on some of the points. I'm back, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, if I can be seen and heard, I can kind of, yeah, um, yeah I, I, I really do welcome this particular session because it's always most valuable to hear directly the voices of those who are going to be affected. Uh, and I think there is always a risk that um, that coalition of the willing can become a coalition of the well-informed and we 
with the same people talking to each other uh, all of the time. So it's really crucial to, to reach out. Um, yeah, uh, and I am very alive. I hope to the concerns of family carers. We have engaged uh, with John's organisation before and absolutely happy to do so again. Um, and what I'm hearing um, are, I think, um, concerns that there is still a lot of lack of certainty, lack of understanding, um, lack of a real sense of how this is going to uh, impact uh, on the ground. Um, and I don't think I'll get the opportunity here and now to um, alleviate those concerns, but please do you know, articulate them by way of scenarios, send us direct questions. Um, if you can point to real life situations and we can give you our sense, and you're right, it's not more than that, but our sense of what that will mean to somebody in the day to day, because that's what really matters to people. And family carers are under such huge pressure already. We need to be able to try and um, provide reassurance that this act isn't going to contribute further to that burden. I really think that it won't. I certainly am I'm hopeful that instead it's going to be um, an asset to the family carer. Uh, and we in the DSS very much have to be a part of that. Anya, you, you were there for the, the, the exchange, which I must say is, is burned into my memory of, of a father of two profoundly disabled daughters saying, and I mean, I know the man well, meaning it, I would love to know whether my daughters would prefer cornflakes or ready for breakfast. And the answer he got, and it wasn't from you, was, well, if you were doing it right, you probably should be able to get some sort of indication. Yeah, right. that's, that's what families are terrified of, that this is going to give a legal basis to that kind of mindset. And I just don't see it that way, I have to say. Um, I, and I don't think there is a risk that through this act, our organisation or anybody else is going to be able to invade the family home and engage at that level of decision making. Um, and I, I think, in fact, family carers probably already are engaged in supported decision making without without calling it that. Mm -hmm. I also think that family carers don't risk being consigned to obscurity or having their really valuable input mm -hmm. overlooked. But you're right, the, t the telling thing will be when we get up and running. But look, um, I absolutely am completely open to bilateral further engagement um, and raise the questions with us. We will do our level best to, to answer and that's absolutely our duty. Okay, thanks Anya. Okay, um, Anya, thank you for coming in there um, to answer those questions. Just before we finish up, I just want to return to Joe to put the same question to Joe. Joe, what do you, what's your greatest hope uh, for the legislation? Well, my greatest hope for the legislation, I want I want it to um, um, uh, be implemented fully and for everyone who's going to go through that process to understand it and uh, hope the best outcome comes for the individuals that need need to take the action that they will take in the future. Thank you, Joe. And I think that's actually um, a very positive note on which to, to end this session today. So I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Unfortunately, we lost Helen and Michael at the end, but I think it was a very informative discussion in considering the hopes and challenges that lie ahead. And I think by sharing, learning and taking a collaborative approach, we can look forward to 2022 to a society where we're all equal in line with Article 12 of the UNCRPG. And I think today we saw many good examples of how that collaboration will help. I think everybody agrees that you know, awareness is very important in training, but look, there is time to do that. I think the public consultations and codes of practice will be equally helpful in addressing those issues. Okay. I'll hand back to Aidy now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashling, and um, well done. Um, and thank you for chairing uh, that, that panel, um, even with all the, the technical glitches that we experienced. But thank you again to Helen, Joe, John and Michael for uh, giving their very valuable perspectives. I think it is really good for us to hear the live and real concerns that people are grappling with on a day-to-day -day and a practical level. Um, and thank you also to Anya for so willingly jumping in there to that conversation. 
Before I pass on to our, our final speaker for the day, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank a number of people without whom the event uh, wouldn't have been possible. So I want to thank again all our speakers, um, particularly those from other jurisdictions who have given us some very valuable learning as to how things work uh, where they are and uh, that can inform our own thinking here in Ireland. Thank you to our two ministers. Um, as I said already, it was a very busy week for them, so we do appreciate them taking the time to send through uh, their pre-recorded messages. And I want to thank all of you uh, in the audience for giving of your time and for staying with us throughout the day. Uh, the, the silver lining of the virtual world is that it means that uh, we, we have many more attendees at our conferences than would have been possible in, in previous years. Um, but I particularly also want to thank our ISL interpreters, Bernadette, Catherine and Shelley, and our PCR captioners, uh, Shane and uh, Michelle. Uh, all of them did an excellent job keeping up with, uh, with us, uh, all speaking probably too fast for your, your preferences, but, but thank you. And thank you to Cormac Staunton of Staunton Media for all the tech support there in the background, and particularly that last session uh, was a little bit challenging. Um, but in particular, I want to thank my uh, NDA team. Um, so uh, thank you to Roz, our head of policy research and public affairs for uh, overseeing the, the whole endeavor, but also for uh, taking on an unexpected speaking role this morning. Thank you, Roz. Um, and a huge thank you to Susan Kenefick and Janelle Veitch, who pulled together the team and the program today. I know you will all agree that it has been a, a very fascinating experience. And thank you to Kate Jennings and Heather O'Leary for all the logistics and the operational support in the background that has meant the day has run so smoothly. Well done to you all. It's been a great day uh, and I hope everyone has uh, enjoyed it to the same extent I have. So I'm now going to hand over to our final speaker of the day, the President of the High Court, Miss Justice Mary Irvine. We're honoured that she's agreed to speak at our conference for the second year running, uh, and that illustrates her commitment to making the courts accessible to and inclusive of persons with disabilities. So thank you all once more, and uh, over to you, Miss Justice Irvine, to close out our day. Thank you very much, um, Aideen, and I will really try not to go too quickly because um, I'm afraid that's one of my particularly bad habits. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to have been afforded the opportunity to deliver a short closing address at today's conference. I'm only sorry that because of my commitments to other matters, including my wardship list, I wasn't in a position to attend earlier in the day to hear what I'm sure were tremendously informative and enlightening contributions from a wide range of highly qualified speakers. As most of you know, the role of a judge is to uphold and apply the rule of law. And in my case, since June of last year, when I was appointed president of the High Court, I have been upholding and applying one particularly old and very outdated law, namely the unhappily entitled Lunacy Regulation Ireland Act of 1871. Thankfully, in the coming years, judges like myself, and in particular the judges of the Circuit Court, will be applying the law as provided for in the infinitely more progressive and long overdue Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act of 2015. I have no doubt that the benefits of the 2015 Act for persons with disabilities and how it will improve their access to justice has been discussed at length by previous speakers, so I don't intend to rehearse its high points. Rather, what I want to do is to tell you about the challenges facing the High Court in transitioning persons who are currently wards of court under the 1871 Act to the very much more beneficial regime provided for in the 2015 Act. And in doing so, I need to stress how important it will be for the High Court to be given the resources 
in particular, the additional judicial resources it will need to meet the heavy burden imposed on it by the 2015 Act. The role of the High Court is to be found in part six of the new Act, which looks fairly innocuous on first reading. Part six has only five modest sections. However, the work involved in complying with those sections will quite frankly be monumental in that they will require the High Court to make a range of decisions in relation to some 2,150 adults currently in wardship, which will have lifelong consequences for them when discharged from wardship. As most of you know, under Section 54 of the Act, the High Court must, within three years of the Act's commencement, which we expect will be next June, review all adult wards and make a declaration as to their capacity. And it is absolutely vital that those decisions be made on the basis of up-to-date, detailed, clear, cogent and comprehensive evidence. Regrettably, the work involved in making a good number of those decisions will be made more difficult and time consuming because it's likely that the evidence as to the capacity of the person concerned will be hotly contested. I think that even those of you who have had no engagement with litigation or the High Court's wardship jurisdiction will appreciate the hours of judicial time that will be needed to allow the court to conduct a detailed review of the capacity of each of the 2,150 adults that it must discharge from wardship. Under the legislation, a separate application will be made to the High Court on behalf of each ward. And having heard all of the evidence concerning their capacity, the court will have to make one of three possible declarations. First, it can declare that the relevant person does not lack capacity. Alternatively, it can declare that the relevant person lacks capacity, but only if they don't have the assistance of a co-decision maker. Or its third option would be to declare that the relevant person lacks capacity, even if they have the assistance of a co-decision maker. And beyond the issue of the ward's capacity, the court will have to deal with all other complications in relation to the ward's assets or estate. This will involve the court engaging with evidence that will extend well beyond medical reports and may include financial reports or reports regarding other outstanding issues in wardship, such as the state of play in any existing legal proceedings in which the ward may be involved. At the moment, the High Court has one judge assigned to hear wardship applications every day of the week. Only a small percentage of the applications before the court on any given day are new applications to bring people deemed to lack capacity under the 1871 Act into wardship. So the fact that post June 2022, there will be no new applications to bring adults into wardship will not substantially reduce the burden of wardship matters on the court's judicial resources. That demand is mostly generated by applicants with applications which involve, for example, the review of orders for detention or medical treatment, or otherwise of a type that impact upon the world's constitutional rights. And all of these reviews will have to continue over the three-year period during which the court is expected to review and discharge all of its 2,150 words. Some easing will, of course, commence in year two, and the numbers of reviews will start to decline in line with the numbers discharged from wardship. Having considered the likely paperwork that will have to be reviewed by a judge before he or she might safely decide upon a ward's capacity and make all other decisions as might be required on a discharge application, it is estimated that one judge will probably be able to deal with three 
non-contentious applications a day. Now that sounds modest, but it's important to remember the amount of materials that will have to be read in advance of those applications, having regard to the importance of the decisions to be made. It follows that we expect that one judge should be able to discharge 450 adults from wardship in a given year. So it doesn't take a mathematical wizard to realize that without additional judicial resources, it will simply be impossible to meet the court's obligations, both current and prospective, within the mandatory three-year statutory timeframe provided for in the Act. It is estimated that at a minimum, the High Court will need one additional judge full-time and another additional judge three days each week in order to meet its obligations. This it cannot do, and I want to make that perfectly clear, from current resources. Having taken so long to get to where we are today, and now that the benefits of the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act are almost tangible, it would be unforgivable if, by reason of a shortage of resources, the High Court found itself having to call upon government to extend the three-year period provided for by statute to allow it meet its obligations under the Act. I'm very pleased to say that a great deal of work has already been done by the wards of court office to prepare for applications to discharge the 2,150 adults currently in wardship. Information is being sent out to those who it is considered will most likely bring their applications at the earliest available opportunity. And the investment committee, which I chair, which manages the funds of wards of court, has already taken steps to minimise the risks to the funds of those wards who will be discharged from wardship within the time frame provided for in the 2015 Act. However, as already said, the success of the move to the new and progressive regime provided for in the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act is heavily dependent upon the delivery of resources which the High Court currently doesn't have. Knowing the importance of this legislation for many of those currently in wardship, my colleagues and I will do everything we possibly can within available resources to ensure we meet our statutory target. And I have no reason to believe that, having designed the process whereby wardship is to be brought to an end, and knowing the additional judicial work that will be necessary to transfer current wards of court to a new and more progressive regime, that the resources required to facilitate that transfer will not be provided. I am sure everyone here today and all stakeholders understand that key to the success of the new regime will be the smooth, timely and orderly transition from the old regime via the court review process. Thank you very much. It only remains uh, for me, um, on behalf of the organisers um, of this conference, to formally draw to a close. Um, I know that Aideen has already thanked um, all of the speakers, the two ministers, the interpreters, um, and the NDA team for all of their work in organizing at uh, the conference. I think the only people she didn't um, thank and who were referred to me for my attention um, are Helen Guinan, chair of the NDA board, and Dr. Aideen Hartney, director of the NDA, who I understand so willingly put their shoulders to the wheel to ensure that today would deliver great results uh, for those with disabilities. So uh, having said those final few words, um, I will now formally declare the conference closed and invite you to leave the meeting by deploying, as usual, the red button on your screen. Thanks very much.